All right, I think I'll just move on into the concept clearance. And uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction and this lead into the, um, and to the common disease variant discovery discussion. So I'm going to begin again with the workshop wish list. And note um, that today, even though clinical applications of sequencing was discussed as a central topic, we're not going to discuss that today. It's its own program. It has its own planning process. But obviously, those programs, those groups of programs, are going to consider the discussions at the workshop. The same uh, with, with the big need to, to enable capture interpretability and analysis of the world sequencing data and a bit about creating this virtuous cycle. Um, those, are, those are items that need their own discussion. And we just heard, uh, we just heard before Phil Bourne talk about uh, some things that bear significantly on, on uh, on this one. Similarly, we're not today going to talk about or talk very much about doing uh, genome function, especially related to interpretation of variants. There's a significant program um, that we have at NHGRI on, on those issues, on those areas, and it, they have their own planning process. And again, they heard the advice at the discussions at the workshop. Um, but I will talk a little bit about that. Um, so that leaves us with these, uh, these four areas representing um, up to six concepts. And uh, I can talk about these a little bit, and you'll see in my write-up I, I previewed these. But these three areas, uh, uh, comparative and evolutionary genomics and the gold genomes, we're going to leave to a future opportunity to discuss. Because it's already a lot to just discuss these three concepts that comprise this area. So the concepts are common disease variant discovery, centers for Mendelian genomics, and a genome sequencing program coordinating center. And again, we'll leave these topics four and five for another day. Just to orient, the total proposed here for items one through three is $71.5 million in 2016. Uh, the 2015 estimated cost of the current large pro sequencing programs at NHGRI is $85 million. Uh, this includes some co-funding. This doesn't yet include any co-funding. The timeline, we are, we are here at Council. Uh, so even though a lot's been done, it's just sort of at the beginning of the timeline, right in the middle of it. Planning for RFA release uh, around the new year, uh, receipt in spring, review in summer, and then uh, a year from now, uh, these would be um, brought back before Council for funding plans. So common disease variant discovery. So what? What's the point? What's the point of this? To establish a collaborative, large-scale genome sequencing effort to identify genome variants contributing to multiple common complex disease phenotypes. To explore comprehensively, and I want to flag that word comprehensively, a range of disease types and architectures to learn general principles of biology of disease and lessons about how to approach these studies. Uh, to undertake and compare a range of study designs. Um, this would entail doing multiple disease studies. Um, they would be very large. At least one of them should be a whole genome, sequence, uh, whole genome sequencing study to push the field, including pushing costs, methods, analyses, all an, in aid of understanding non-coding variation. And finally, to develop foundational deliverables, such as data resources for disease research communities, know-how for similar studies, technology innovation, data handling, standards, policies, and possibly common controls. So why? Why do this? Well, common disease affects a lot of people. Um, and understanding the genomic variants influencing risk or protection from these will provide insight into the basis for important individual diseases um, and diagnosis implications for treatment and even identify, uh, identify targets for therapy. Um, this also would provide general insight into the biology of disease and relationship between genotype and phenotype. Um, it obviously requires a lot of genome sequencing, especially to discover rare variants systematically. Um, studies need to be comprehensive. They need to be well-powered. Uh, large sample numbers and numbers that were discussed for some of these in the workshop were up to 50,000 or more. And again, better a few comprehensive than many partial. Um, 
We need scale uh, to compare across multiple diseases, um, to learn uh, to compare across multiple designs. Um, and finally, a well-chosen set of comprehensive studies and data sets have high potential to provide a resource uh, that will be catalytic, and both for individual disease communities, so large, large sets of variants and association information, but also uh, developing for developing tools for interpreting non-coding function, et cetera. So one scientific consideration that, uh, that I think requires some considerations, how many studies will be enough to do this, to explore a range of disease types, architectures, and allow examination of a range of design. And here we propose, again, we propose six to 10 over four years, and that's as a minimum. Right? And another scientific uh, consideration is what is comprehensive? And this is something that we can only define partly in advance. You can do it with reference to power. You can do it by saying that you'll keep going until your discovery curve falls off. There are always qualifiers about the population studied. Uh, and there are practical limits. So just for practical reasons and scientific reasons, uh, the program will need to uh, have a starting point and then iterate, it, iterate on it and refine it as a program goal. In addition to the primary objectives of this program, there are some desirable features that we would like to include. That is to allow some production of non-genome sequence data, for example, epigenomic data or transcriptomes, but that has to be coordinated with the function program. Um, we would like the flexibility to do projects that are not directly related, large sequencing projects that are not directly related to a specific disease. Um, there are ideas about that that have been floating around, um, and this would, could be an opportunity uh, if it came up. Um, and finally, opportunities for outreach or liaison with other investigators and programs, like a hub and spokes model. Um, which I've seen used successfully in other programs, uh, for collaboration with outside investigators, for example, on pilot level efforts that link sequencing to function, or develop new al analyses or explore uh, tech development, uh, technology development um, efforts at, uh, at scale, implemented at scale. There are some practical considerations, um, um, budget considerations. Um, in the workup, in the write-up, I, um, I showed what our current estimation is for the cost of a very large project, and um, like this. And um, the total for seven projects, which would include one whole genome study, assuming very large sample numbers, is about $292 million, or $73 million a year spread over four years. But we're only proposing to provide 80 percent of that, or $60 million a year with the idea that we know that several factors will reduce cost over time, but we don't know exactly what the timeline is, how they'll, how they'll come into play. Um, NHGRI has always done well to be optimistic about costs of sequencing, um, and I think it's also reasonable to be optimistic about costs of data storage, which for whole genome studies are a substantial part of the cost. Um, and these could easily come down twofold in two years. Um, Study design. Not all studies will require the largest number of samples, um, and if common controls pan out uh, later on in the program, it might be able to do a lot more and more efficiently. And there are also other, uh, other efficiencies to be gained. I should point out that, um, that some studies might actually require more in order to be comprehensive, uh, so this could play both ways. And finally, we are going to actively seek co-funding and, as I'll talk about in a bit, other funding collaborations. Considering all these factors, we have high confidence that seven studies can be done as described, and certainly uh, if, uh, if, uh, certainly if um, it's possible that more, uh, more could be done with this budget. Organizational considerations. We are proposing cooperative agreements um, in a research network. There's, uh, I don't think, any other way to do this, um, and an open competition. We propose a small number of awards, two to four, simply because the size of the projects is likely to be very large. And the more you need to split them up, the harder it is to coordinate. There are also other efficiencies, um, but that has to be weighed against um, uh, bringing in different approaches. Um, 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 
we need good peer review of individual projects. And that seems obvious, but the fact is with a, with a project, with a program this large uh, that will bring bringing in multiple projects over time, um, we'll have to bring in, we'll have to have a mechanism to do a good job in bringing in new projects. Um, so what we're proposing is that the initial year of work will be fully proposed in the application. And again, that's to, to show how, to show how, uh, to make sure that the, um, um, the sequencing and the, um, the samples and the data analysis are all presented as an integrated package to begin with, but then bring in other projects over time. Um, there is an X01 mechanism that uh, allows for use of community resources. Um, there are community, we could have community workshops to, um, to begin to design projects, um, and to look at new projects. Um, some projects may be initiated by other institutes, um, um, and that would be an opportunity for co-funding, um, and possibly work through the X01 mechanism. And finally, um, over, over the years, there have been uh, projects that have come up, new opportunities that have come up um, for large-scale sequencing projects that have been very high priority uh, for NHGRI, and um, we have wanted to take advantage of the opportunity. In the workshop, and coming out of the workshop, and even before, we'd consider how to leverage our funding. Um, and thinking about new ways to do this. Whatever mechanism we come up with has to allow or incent uh, co-funding, for example, through XO1s to allow a route for participation of other institutes. We're going to need to reach out to other institutes to collaborate on, this, on these. I have to say that so far we've had very, uh, very good experience with, an, with a small number of inst other institutes uh, collaborating on projects in, in cancer, of course, TCGA and uh, with, um, in, uh, with NHLBI um, and uh, NIA and others. Um, but we want to develop these further and broaden, broaden the number of uh, collaborations. Um, second, the mechanism, whatever mechanism we come up with, should incent applicants to seek other outside funding to add to the number of example diseases that can be explored um, and what we're thinking of is making partial awards and then providing additional funds to grantees over time, providing those funds, uh, uh, the held back funds to grantees that are successful over t in time in identifying resources for more or more comprehensive projects. And finally, whatever mechanism we have has to accommodate potentially significant changes in capacity or volume. Uh, for example, large increases due to identification of new opportunities as well as changes due to the completion of projects in one place versus another. So we are always asked to talk about relationships to other programs that are ongoing at NHGRI, and, and this, is, this is actually easy to talk about because, uh, because these programs uh, will be related to almost everything else that we do. And, and uh, I can talk about any of these in detail, um, but the fact is that, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, sometimes talk about a flagship, but in fact this is just one element in a fleet of, of fairly substantial efforts. And we don't know exactly all the interactions in advance, but, um, but we know that there are going to be opportunities uh, that come up. Relationships to worldwide efforts, that's a little harder. Uh, because there are many. There are going to be many individual complex disease efforts in the next four years. There's no question. Um, and we also have talked already about some large cohort studies that are starting up, and in four years we expect that they will be very productive. And all along we're going to need to look for opportunities to collaborate uh, and synergize. Um, I mean, one idea is just to, to, uh, to piggyback on some of these um, or to avoid them if they're going to be done well um, and done completely. Um, and expand the range of studies to get the better general insight by going elsewhere uh, than these. I think with these, there's a lot of opportunity for collaborations on analysis. That would be very interesting. So we have the technical, so some summary slides. We have the capability to comprehensively find genomic variants that contribute to common disease. 
The proposed program will attempt this for a representative set of common diseases over four years. In doing so, we'll explore and compare a range of genomic architectures and project designs, as many as possible, to learn general principles. Um, the program will develop improved methods uh, for obtaining and analyzing the data, which will lay a foundation for the wider community. Um, and finally, the program is intended to develop resources for communities of those investigating specific diseases and also resources for genomics in general. A couple of details. We believe that the recommended funding will be sufficient to have high confidence to achieve the minimum goals given reasonable predictions, but will work to exceed that minimum. To increase the number of studies that we can do and the likelihood of success, we'll seek co-funding. We'll structure the funding to incent institutional and other contributions. We'll probably need to try several approaches before we know what works. Um, and again, finally, uh, the scientific goals and requirements of the program mean that it will need as much flexibility as possible built into the program, into the solicitation, and into the funding. And I'm going to stop there and ask for questions or comments. Who are the discussants? No, there, but there are three, weren't there three discussants? I'm sorry, I forgot to. I thought you had picked, I thought you had picked uh, discussants. But I'll start with one. So, um, I'd like to, See if you could clarify or expand a little bit on on this concept of comprehensive. So, so you you couched it, I think, largely in terms of the sample size, or maybe it's phenotype diversity, or or maybe it's sample diversity. But there are multiple dimensions you could think about here for comprehensive, and one is sample size, one is the architecture of diseases, and the other is the genome. And I think if you, in terms of the depth, exome versus genome. And I, I guess if one really wanted this to be ambitious, you'd shoot for all. And, and it, seems, it seems in a cursory way what you've got here is deep on sample size, semi-broad on diseases, but not so deep on the genome. And, and I wonder uh, if that was discussed and if you'd like to elaborate on trying to push the field further than something that in five years' time probably will wish we'd gone deeper. Yeah, so, so there's really two parts to this. So first, first I, agree, I agree with you. I think that if in five years we, we are not doing I'd be very surprised if whole genomes weren't the standard for this kind of study. Um, and built into this, these kinds of programs is the ability to, to assess midway and, I mean, the hard part is in some ways getting the samples, right? Once, once you, can, you can adjust the amount of sequence, the kind of sequencing that you do uh, within the confines of technology. So we expect this program to keep up with the technology and the costs as they advance. But I, I, I wonder at the current amount, I mean, uh, just tr uh, the, the amount, the discussion was set based on a fairly conservative reckoning of the, uh, of the resources that, that we could have for this and what we think the state of the art is, hoping that we can succeed it. I guess just put another way, you went for 80 percent of today's cost or something. Why not, why not really push that number? What, 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 why did you come up or how with? 80 percent of where we are today. Uh, is that just seen as too far to reach to try and drive costs and other access? I, I, think, I, think it's almost, I think it's almost a matter of, it depends, it depends how, you're driving, how you're driving costs. So this, is, this, is a, um, this would be a vote of, I mean, stating it in a strong way would be a vote of confidence, essentially, that things will get, that things will get there. It will, be, it will be a challenge also. Um, that, to push things in that direction. So I think it's in the way of, it has to be stated that way between those, between those two with elements of, of both of those. Howard? So I'd, I'd like to echo Lon's uh, uh, statement by saying I think the way it's written I support completely. I think it's a great idea. But I think opening it up a little bit around the context, as, as Lon suggested, I think it would be key so that you can look at those different dimensionalities instead of locking it into, you have to do this and this. So I, I agree 100 percent. Then I have a question related to um, seeking a, uh, other funding sources, which I think is a great idea. Um, how do you view um, what to do if some of the potential funders don't have the same data sharing 
uh, guidelines. So, for example, uh, I'll use pharma, a pharmaceutical company as an example. They'd be willing to share some data, but not other data uh, for exchange for doing this. How, how would you manage that? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question because how, how I would manage it completely depends on, on the importance of the sample sets. Um, the default, of course, is, is maximum openness. And we would ask for that first. And we always, and we always do, and we always have. Um, most of the negotiations that we've had to have is, is over details when we've done collaborations with other ICs. And those, those have, have worked out. But I agree with you. I, I, I think our first preference would be to say no to those samples if there were any alternatives. But we would have to, we would have to do an assessment. So why don't I help you out here, because I know there's a lot sure. of hands going up. So I see Dee Dee and I saw Bob. So I don't know if there's anybody else, but Dee Dee and then Howard, okay? So I would say in general, the concept ideas seem okay, but uh, some of the things that were brought up at the beginning are about blurring boundaries versus defining boundaries and also measurable progress. And so I feel like this kind of goes in a different direction from that. And I feel like the concept as a whole uh, lacks a big vision, and, and I've said this earlier about something that's really exciting and visionary, like sequence the human genome or $1,000 genome or something like that. So. I don't see that pizzazz and focus to the concept, and I'm, maybe we can it can still be done with these general principles that are in there, but in terms of how how it's presented, I, I think it's really important so that there are really clear goals, and I feel like this is the largest resource really for the institute, and to be able to have this opportunity to to do something really big with tremendous impact impact. So how will these centers work together in a coordinated fashion so that they can really leverage their capacity, large-scale capacity and, and expertise, uh, and to be able to do something that couldn't be done otherwise? So instead of discrete little projects, um, I know you're emphasizing the large scale, but I, I think that needs more. And then when you talk about comprehensive, I see it even, there are more dimensions than that. And, and I know you say, yes, we have the other programs, like in code and, and other ones, uh, but I feel like this is an opportunity to, at this stage, to try to be more integrative. We're going to have all these samples, uh, 25,000 cases, 25,000 controls. They can be utilized and gain even more comprehensive data that can be integrated to help truly solve uh, several diseases. Um, and then in terms of, you talked about the set-aside. Um, and I don't know what proportion that is, but I guess there's different ways to do that. But it seems to me that one scenario would be that you're working right now to build these big partnerships that so that when the grantees come in, they hit the ground running and they're off on these big projects. Or if that's not possible, that a large portion of this set aside uh, is given so that when the centers are awarded funding and they're chosen <coughs> as the centers, they can work together on, this, on these huge collaborative uh, project definition and execution. So those are uh, some of my thoughts. So, so you raised a number of issues. I do want to address one, um, which is uh, which is um, working together, because the because whoever these grantees are, they will have to work together, uh, probably a bit more tightly than uh, the current program does. Although I should say that the current program uh, on select projects has worked very well. Uh, different elements have come together very well to, um, for large projects. Um, and that's going to have to be made very clear uh, in, the, in the solicitation, that that's the expectation. Um, and uh, you know, we, I think we're going to talk later in, in closed session about some specifics, um, um, about, about um, some aspects of what you discussed. Th those could be, there could be some incentives also built in for, um, for combined Combined work. There's, there's other, there are ways to address that that I think are, um, uh, can easily be part of this program. I mean, for your scenarios, Didi, that you just gave for some of this cost sharing, I would, they're all on the list. I mean, 
we don't, we're not we're not going to be locked in any one of them. Any every one of the things you just said are possible, and one of, as as we go forward, we will be exploring having a, sort of ideas in advance of the partnerships we're ready to go on. Some partnerships that might be brought to us by centers. I think the list will, we want to have maximal flexibility, and I think any and all of those mechanisms might be used. The concern I might have is based on the current centers and there's moment they get momentum and they're like, well, I have these samples, I, and then things get kind of locked in. And they're also doing like some smaller projects. And I just feel like it's how this all is implemented and is extremely important so that we really gain the benefit of having the large scale aspects. Yep. So. Uh, Eric, you said you had one quick point that related to DDs. I thought that the point she made about sort of maybe mundaneness of the current proposal was easily addressed by many of the points on your slides, Adam, I thought were, were fantastic. They're not reflected in the current write-up. So as you formalize the concept, if you could take some of these more exciting points about the bridges between functional and study design, et cetera, move them into the document, I think would help a lot. Okay. Happy to do that. Okay. We have Bob and then Howard and then Dan. I, I don't have an answer to the following issue, but I just thought I'd raise it anyway, which is this question about completeness. So I, I view this project in the entire context of going back to when we first we wanted a genome sequence, then we wanted a DB SNP, we wanted to know what the variants are, then we wanted to apply the variants to understanding complex diseases and all the GWAS studies that were done, which you know have had some successes and, and in some sense the things that the GWAS has failed to do was also informative. So GWAS has, has, has given us both positives and informative negatives. It would be nice to have informative negatives from this. So in other words, pick that cohort so you really have enough environmental information and you have enough longitudinal information so that if we fail, which we might, mm -hmm. to find the variants that you think might be contributing, it's going to tell us something and not just, oh, well, we just didn't have enough information to really answer the question. It's a good point. Howard? Uh, the two different uh, unrelated points. So one is, I think part of the difficulty is we all went a different ship. You talk about the flagship, and uh, it, in the past, it's really been more of an aircraft carrier on which uh, exciting projects could take off and land and, and move forward. And, you know, now often we're talking about it more in this right up more of a destroyer type model or, you know, maybe we went the love boat or something. I mean, we, we need to figure out like, what is it that we want and how do we do it? And, and I think there's a vagueness to with the write up that kind of reflects that we want to have the whole armada and not just, you know, a particular flagship. So I, I think part of it is reframing it that way. And, and even the title, that, I mean, the title could be changed to kind of change the mindset in which we're approaching it. And, you know, so I think there's some aspects there because it's it's really doesn't reflect the catalytic uh, nature in which you're mm -hmm. now talked about it the second thing is is uh, phenotype rules the day and, and the way the way things are written right now it's the cost of genotyping and ancillary elements around it and pulling together a couple thousand carefully phenotype patients is doable Putting together 25,000 for many of the phenotypes, we're going to have to cobble together data, data sets that might be high quality individually, but weren't designed to be pulled together. And so things get dumbed down and often, and we've seen that even with some, you know, we can pull the, together 100,000 patients for height, um, but we can't really do that for, for some of the other diseases we're interested in. And so I think some care needs to be taken, maybe even partnering with institutes. You know, if NHLBI is going to do uh, 100,000 patients worth of prospective trials in this next few years, maybe some targeting needs to be done so that uh, the, the phenotyping consent or whatever is in a way that they, that could be the platform on which this is done. Because I think right now we're kind of saying, oh, there will be phenotype samples, and let's just focus on the genotyping, and I think that will get us in a bad place. Dan? I don't think I'm going to say anything that hasn't been said before, but I'll say it a different way. That so so. One of the, the concerns has been that, that there's not a, a pizzazz to this. And, and something you said in your director's talk that, that made me think, maybe, maybe the title of this should be Pathways to 21st Century Cures or something like that. But the and, congressmen and congressmen will be very flattered if they did that. Well, yes. well so some, but some, if, some brief 
uh, dumbed down articulation of what the vision is. And, and no matter what the, I mean, I still, th and I think that that's not an unreasonable way of, of, of phrasing it, even if it comes from Congress. So, when oh, we're in public session, right? Um, I'll be careful, I'll be more careful. Right, right, so, right. So, so but, but one of the, the concerns that I have is at the end of the day, we're not gonna be able to measure whether there's any kind of success. So that, so that the, the idea of metrics is built into the, to the document, but it doesn't really say what those metrics might even look like. And, and one metric might be, you know, how many, how many, functional, how many functional variants have we found? How many, uh, how many of those might be, you know, really useful markers for clinical use or, or markers for drug development or, or whatever? And then uh, the other thing that I really want to echo is what, what Howard just said, and that is that uh, phenotyping is not free. Um, to get 100,000 well phenotyped uh, diabetics or bald people or blue-eyed people, it, that, that will require resources of some kind that aren't, um, that aren't sort of a central part of this document. The, it, there's this idea that we'll partner with somebody and, it'll, and magic will happen. And, and, in, and there's the great danger then that ma the magic will be that you don't get the right phenotypes and, and the lesson we learn is that you should have got the right phenotypes. Mm -hmm. So I think that more attention needs to be paid uh, to that. Okay, Jay and then Jim. I'll just, I mean, I'll, I'll echo the point again. I think the title is not entirely inspiring, but I could imagine if you really think about what this is about, it's about the contribution of rare variants to common diseases, right? That's kind of fundamentally what this appears to be about, at least, um, particularly if you're focused on, on on, on the exomes, um, and and in many ways that's a, that's still an unanswered question, right? We haven't really asked that question with appropriate power for most diseases. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, this kind of echoes some things that were already said, but I'm not sure. It, it does seem important to define success and failure, not in a way that's tied to whether we hit our production goals and things like that, but explicitly around if if this is the question we're going to ask, then let's ask it. And succeed or fail, at least let's have an answer at the end of it. Um, uh, yeah. Jim? So yeah, I just I just want to put my two cents worth in for not over promising. Um, I think that talking about cures, especially in the title, would be insane. <laughs> um, I, you know, I yes, that's what we're all after, but we aren't doing ourselves any any favors, right? If we over promise. I, I would also just, I wanted to amplify what Lon and what, what Howard said. You know, it's my understanding that, that the majority of the variants that have been linked to disease phenotype are actually not in the coding region. And I'm, I really worry about, about focusing on the exome um, because it's cheaper when we already have evidence that, that maybe the most important stuff isn't in the exome. Exome, excuse me, for for uh, for these variants. Um, so, so, yeah, and because it's a, a small number of awards, I would also encourage to build in some mechanisms of collaboration that they're not so dependent on other institutes uh, as a means to engage the the community at large, the scientific community at large, other than uh, the 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 ones who are positioned to be the, uh, the leaders of the effort. Uh, and I say that because um, I think it's, it's important to, again, get excitement, get a feel that uh, people doing certain, uh, studying certain diseases can be a part of it. Can you give it, just to make sure I understand it, can you give an example of what you might mean by that? What kind yeah, of let, let, let's say someone who is an expert in, in, in some uh, relatively common disease, but it is in a small institution, and uh, they want to apply for the, I mean, it's too much work and too little chance to um, be able to get one such uh, award. But if in the uh, RFA it's something written that you have to have two, three of such collaborators, then it, it's the time to make partnerships happen. Eric? It goes back to the comment about phenotyping, but a little bit different. Just caution about 
focusing too much on disease only. I mean, a lot of interest today is on finding loss of function variants, even non-protein encoding loss of function variants that are protective for disease. And if, if that's the goal, and I think that's a laudable goal, particularly for this institute, you're going to need to define the phenotype of protection. And if all you have is a lot of cases of sick people, um, it's very difficult to do. So having people with low risk, low LDL cholesterol, low blood pressure, low X, Y, and Z, I think is extremely important if that's a primary goal. And quite a bit of thought needs to be put into how to do that with, at scale, as you say. Very quick. I was just just back to the vision and being able to have a um, measurable progress. I mean, you should be able to, in one very concise sentence, state what it is you're going to accomplish and what you're going to have at the end of the day. Um, just a point of clarification. I know we're going to be heading heading towards a a, a, a vote on this uh, as I in open session, I think. And um, my understanding is that when we um, vote on this, it will uh, not pertain to any dollar amount. It's just of the concept qualitatively, not of the magnitude of the effort. That's certainly fair, but I don't think, given the goals here, I don't think you're going to see this FOA at half the amount or twice the amount. The FOA. I mean, the dollars that are put up here are a realistic estimate of what the staff thinks are needed to achieve the goals that are listed, with all the caveat of dropping costs and whatnot. Ron? So, um, let me just rehearse one more argument, one, one more time to see how far we can go. Uh, at the risk of showing my age, it was almost a, a, exactly a decade ago this same argument was, and debate was being had for GWAS on uh, exactly what those studies should look like and how deep we should go on this and how many samples we should go and so on. And, and I think they did give both positive and, and negative results because, because actually we tried to compromise and get it all and do a largest number of diseases, as many samples as we could get at the time and as deep as we could go on the genome. I am, I'm, I'm just worried that one, one study of genome sequence will leave us flat here, and I would like to encourage to, to push as far as we possibly can on all the dimensions. And I, I, I've said it already once before, but I, I just want to, as, as, as far as you can actually take this in all criteria, I think uh, we'll be better off. Lon, just uh, can I just clarify what you mean? So but do you mean in all the dimensions in every sub-study, or you mean if you look across what this accomplishes over four years, the set of projects it does, we've touched comprehensiveness at least one or two times in every dimension, at least in one or of the, more of the projects. Yeah, thanks. So, so, so I agree with this principle of trying more than one because you never know if you just, you know, had we just picked at that time hypertension and bipolar, we might not be here doing what we, we did today um, at that time. Uh, um, so I don't think one is enough, right? And I heard one or at least one, that makes me nervous. So several in terms of the genome would, would make me feel better. So you get some shots on that to, to really test it out. And I know there's, there are practical considerations here, but there are trade-offs one could give too. And I, would, I don't know if we're locked down exactly on the number of diseases and samples and so on at this point, but if we're not, it's, I'd like to leave that open yeah, and I'd a, like to push for more. Uh, it's, a yeah, it's a judgment about, about comprehensiveness across all those dimensions, including a range. Yeah. So Howard and then Bob. Yeah, so, so I, I'm, I'm with Lon again on this. And so I think if I, if I can look at from my perspective what Lon is saying is that rather than define how many diseases are going to be looked at and defining whether it's whole genome or these others, I think it should be more open than that. If somebody can come in with a proposal that is able to do the whole thing on genome and the reviewers believe that that's the way to do it, why should we put the boundary on that? I think we should force the issue and figure out who's got the best ideas. If somebody is, can show that, they, that exons uh, sequencing is the way to go, fine. But I think if we put too prescriptive on that, I think we limit the discovery potential. Bob? I, I would just like to, to say that, um, I, that I don't think we should be at a place where we're scratching our heads at the end saying, well, maybe it, we didn't get 
an answer that we wanted because maybe of this, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. We should have as many informative negatives and as few uninformative negatives as, as, as possible. And I agree with what Lon said with one small exception, which is that we now have 10 years worth of GWAS experience, and we should be using that information to design this study more intelligently. N not that the GWAS was unintelligent, it's just that it was dataless. Any, Didi? Back to just how to be more integrative with other kinds of data, can you just elaborate a little bit on, on how you could see that happening? With yeah, so I think it might be helpful. So, so there are some things that are that I can predict or have control over uh, by by the way this is set up, and there's some things that that are going to be harder to, but you can anticipate that there will be opportunities. So the mechanism for that in this, as described in this concept, there are two. One is one is fairly simple-minded, and that's just to allow data data types to be produced that can be produced on sequencing platforms that aren't genome sequence. So that's that's one step in that direction. I don't think that that's I don't think that's really a substantive way of addressing your question, but it's beginning to beginning to reach out in that direction. The other way is we know that there are going to be a lot of of we we are assume that coming out of this will be um, comprehensive sets of well-validated, um, carefully analyzed variants as a, as a data set. What if somebody had a, an idea about uh, somebody outside um, of the consortium, had an idea about, uh, about how to do uh, rapid functional validation, either different, either uh, computationally with new, uh, with new algorithms and or maybe experimentally, maybe there's some rapid way to do it. Um, I think that this effort, in, inside the effort as part of the withheld funds, should, should include uh, uh, some funds that are withheld that are sufficient for pilot studies so, to, to enable those. But that, so that's, that's the short term, and that's within this program. I think, I think that, that there's a a wider perspective on this. It's not within this program, but has to be considered as the function program uh, is doing its planning um, and comes up uh, uh, and will come to council with its plans uh, uh, several councils from now. Uh, Elise, are you here? Are you? Yeah, I would just, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about ENCODE and planning for the future, and uh, I think a lot of what we're plan thinking about for the future will take on from what was discussed at this workshop, and we'll be presenting plans, in, uh, I think, in the May Council. But I, I think it's, I think it, you know, did, it was a theme in the workshop, and I, I hear it, I hear it here, um, and, uh, and I think it's, it's good to, continue to, to raise these to, so when, when the opportunities come up where we can take advantage of them. Are there any other? Are we, are we ready for a, uh, a vote? I certainly am. So um, can I get a motion to approve the concept as proposed? Second. All in favor, and I'm going to ask you to keep your hands up. Thank you. Uh, those uh, disapproving? Anyone abstaining? Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Great, thanks. All right, uh, Lou, are you in the house? There she is. Okay. So Lou Wong is now going to present the uh, concept for the uh, Centers for Mendelian Genomics. <laughs> 